Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Research Director and Founder, SANS Institute, Alan Parler. One, one of the real joys of the year is when RSA asks us to bring together three of the instructors who are most familiar with exactly how attacks are made in order to guess but they have a reason to guess correctly, in order to guess exactly what the newest and most dangerous threats are going to be. And that's what we're going to do today. I have three people to help, um, each of whom has a reason to be inside all of the newest attacks, not because they caused them. The first is Ed Scotus, who is SAN's uh, Penetration Testing Curriculum Director and, and creator of NetWars and Cyber City. The second is Johannes Ulrich, who creates uh, Internet Storm Center that 30,000 of you use every day. And, and the next one is James Line, who is our European research director and creator of CyberStart. They're all here. So you guys are just as much players in this one. This is a session where you actually have an active role to play. Um, those of you who came before, came to these sessions in past years know that we gave out Dove chocolates to everybody who gave us a question we used. That's hard in this room. <laughs> so we're taking the questions in at q at sans.org if you're asking questions. And the questions we use actually get you $25 Amazon gift certificates, which is not as good as an immediate Dove chocolate, but it's pretty good for, for a second prize. Um, the second thing that we did this year, because we get asked every year, because people have trouble counting all the way up to five, is we um, put the, all five of the most critical new attack vectors up at a site, sans.org slash five. So you can, you, if you want to get ahead of it, if you're going to get bored listening to these guys, then you can, you can go ahead and look, look them up. Um, our first expert is Ed Scotus. I asked Ed what he was most thankful for. And he said, something completely surprised me because of all the tens of thousands of people using his cyber ranges, net wars. He said it was creating 504. Uh, 504 is his course that teaches incident handling and how hacker exploits work and how you stop them. And uh, that course has launched 20,000 cybersecurity careers. So Ed knows how the attacks work, and he's going to tell you what he thinks are the next two. And just as a quick introduction, he took a real sharp turn this year. All of you who've heard him before know he shows you exactly how the new attacks are going to work. He went a completely different direction. And I started to get worried about it, but then I saw that in the past nine years, he's never been wrong. So I paid a lot more attention. So Ed? Ah, thank you. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate your kind introduction. Good morning. I'd like to share with you two particular attack areas that I'm seeing increasingly in the cases that I work on and the incidents that I handle. The first of these is associated with leakage from repositories, repositories for code, as well as repositories of data. And these are stored on the cloud. The truth is we develop software in a very different way than we did 10 years ago or even five years ago. We use tools like GitHub for collaboration. We use cloud-based storage to hold the data, like Amazon S3 or Google Cloud's platform storage or Microsoft Azure storage and more. And the problem here is these are often not configured securely. Either the data gets put into a repository that hasn't been properly configured, or it gets put into the wrong repository. Attackers are increasingly mining and searching for repositories that don't have the appropriate security. There have been many attacks in the last 12 months on this. Verizon has suffered two breaches associated with this. Bad guys getting access to millions of records. Time Warner has been hit with this stuff. In fact, Uber has been hit with millions of records being exposed. And the US Army has leaked over 100 gigabytes of data via unsecured Amazon S3 buckets. This is indeed a problem either misconfiguring the buckets or putting the data in the wrong buckets. Last September, September of 2017, there were over a dozen different breaches associated with this particular vector, and it only seems to get even juicier for the bad guys going forward. So what can you do about this? 
If you look at the critical controls, the top number one critical control is having an asset inventory. And I talk to a lot of organizations saying, hey, do you have an asset inventory? And sometimes they'll respond saying, yes, we know where 100% of our assets are. And I'll say, well, what do you mean by that? We're talking servers, we're talking clients, we're talking mobile devices. Now, first thing is 100%, really? That's pretty optimistic. But I'll follow it up with saying, okay, so do you know where your data assets are? Do you have an inventory of those? And then I get the blank stare. Data assets? What are you talking about data assets? In other words, most organizations have focused on an inventory of computer systems. And that's important. You need to know what your computer systems are so you can secure them. But if you don't know what your data assets are, and you're increasingly putting them on computer systems that you don't own and operate, you've got a big problem. Do you really have an asset inventory of your most important assets if you don't have your data? So my advice to you is to have in your organization a data curator, someone whose job responsibility is to know your data assets and how they're distributed through your computing assets that you own, as well as in the cloud. You then need to educate your developers and your architects to interact with your data curator so you can have that control over your most vital asset. There are also some free tools that you can use that can help your use of things like GitHub. There's a tool called Git Secret and another one called Get Secrets, very similar spelling. But these are two different tools that are both dedicated to preventing your developers from submitting code into a Git repository, either a public one or a private one, that includes secrets, like credentials for accessing a database, or other secrets, like crypto keys and so forth. They're tremendous tools. You could also use one, a free tool called Get Rob. Git Rob can be used by penetration testers or vulnerability assessment personnel, or it could even be used by cyber defenders to go through Git repositories belonging to your organization to look and see if there are credentials or crypto keys or other sensitive information there. There's also some tremendous work going on in applying machine learning and AI to help defend and detect leakage via the cloud. Amazon has a service called Macy, M-A-C-I-E, and it's a service that you subscribe to in S3. It will crawl through your S3 buckets and automatically identify for you what it thinks is your most sensitive data. It'll also do data analytics of access of your systems so you can see if there's anomalies that might be consistent with an attack. Microsoft has its Azure SQL Threat Detection Service. What this does is it looks through the access logs in an automated fashion of your SQL databases in Azure to see if there's any attack patterns associated with getting access to those systems. And then Google has its Cloud Data Loss Prevention API, another extended service that your developers can call into. And it applies context-sensitive information to determine if there's any personally identifiable information associated with your data. And the bottom line here is you need to review your access logs, whether you do this manually or use one of these automated tools to help with it. When you're putting data in the cloud, you've got to keep track of it carefully. The second big thing I'd like to talk to you about is big data analytics. You see, I've spent much of the last 20 years of my career focusing on innovative ways to get shell on a target system. I'm talking about command shell. I've hacked into it. I can run commands on that machine, and that gives me power. But increasingly, over the last year, the cases that I've been involved with and the issues that I've been talking with people about are not about hacking the system, but instead hacking the data, doing data analytics, pulling different sources of data. Each one by itself might be innocuous, but by synthesizing the data and de-anonymizing it together, we have a very, very powerful attack. Sometimes I think that, that maybe I'm fighting the last war by focusing on how do I get command shell on a target box when things have moved into how do you hack the data itself, not just for, ex for exfiltration, but to undermine the business of the target organization. And then I realize it's actually not a different war. The war is still the war to defend our computer systems and our data from attack. It's a new front in that war. So what do I recommend that you do? You need to be careful with exposing data, even if it doesn't seem particularly important. Even if your data is anonymized, if it gets exposed, it could still undermine your organization. One of the classic examples here happened about 10 years ago, or over the last 10 years. Netflix has a contest called the Netflix Prize, where Netflix publishes anonymized data associated with people who watch various movies. But you can't identify the individual user. You can only say that this user watched movie X, Y, and Z. Some researchers took that data that's anonymized and then took another data source, IMDb, 
And then they looked in IMDb to see if there was a user account in there that around the same time had watched movies X, Y, and Z. Maybe they only found one that watched movie X and Z, but had a similar rating to the anonymized Netflix account that had, that had X, Y, and Z. And therefore, applying some statistical analysis, they could infer that that account also watched movie Y, which is a leakage of some private information, right? So you need to analyze your business risks in terms of the privacy implications. Someone might hack in and get data that you don't think is sensitive, but by combining that data, by hacking that data together with other insensitive data sources, you can have a really big significant problem. So you need to consider how your data could be used with others' data in a breach to cause big problems to undermine your business. Also, as security professionals, we need to understand how to leverage open source intelligence as part of our data analytics. And to that end, every year, my team releases a free challenge that we post on the internet. It's called the Holiday Hack Challenge. We keep it up all year round. And our Holiday Hack Challenge 2017 has Santa's naughty and nice list posted online, but it's suitably anonymized. However, by doing data analytics and combining it with other data sources, you can actually analyze this data and find out insider threats on the North Pole. So I encourage you to check that out. I'd like to turn this back over to Alan Paller so that we can move to our next panelist. That was, that was Ed Scotus, for those of you who came in late, but nobody let you in late, so you were all here. So you know that. Um, our next expert is Johannes Ulrich. He is the person who uh, created the Internet Storm Center. Um, he does the morning podcasts that 11,000 people listen to, and he does the daily diaries that 30,000 people watch on what happened yesterday on what the new attacks are. So just as Ed gets into all of the cases the government gets involved in, Johannes gets all early warning on lots of the, lots of the cases. He's going to take you a little bit different direction. Um, I also asked Johannes what he was most thankful for, and it's interesting. Um, his was to have, to have gathered the, the volunteer group that makes up Internet Storm Center. There are people in many countries around the world who every day and every night analyze new attacks and then write them up at the Storm Center diary, and that's, that's his. So, Johannes, you're next. Thank you for the introduction, Alan. Now, what excites me always about security is how things change. And we are doing these panels now in one form or another for about the last 10 years. Now, each year there's something new, something exciting really here to talk about. Now, last year I talked about how nobody really wants your data anymore. They already have it all. So instead of selling data on the black market, they sold it back to you using ransomware. Now, Attackers also got a little more creative in how they use the data. You may have a life insurance account, and the life insurance offered you online access. Well, you're a security professional. You're not going to set up online access. You don't trust that. Hmm? Now, what the attackers now do is they use all that stolen data about you using some of the techniques that Ed talked about, and they set up online access for you. Hmm? Well, um, so with all the data being stolen, being used, and not really being all that valuable anymore, what are the attackers doing next? And that's where they are now using uh, the system for uh, crypto coin mining. Now, this really became obvious earlier this year. Alan just talked about our volunteers. This is something that uh, Renato Marino from Brazil, one of our volunteers, sort of broke. He was involved in a number of breaches where PeopleSoft was breached. If you're familiar with PeopleSoft, that's your crown jewels. It's a big deal when PeopleSoft gets breached. So Renato told me, hey, Johannes, I ran into these systems. I looked at them. They, they didn't look at the data. Instead, the only thing they did was they installed a crypto coin miner. Now, OK. We looked at it closer. We found a couple of logs that the bad guys left behind on machines they used to control this network. Thousands of servers, many of them running big software packs with tons of data like PeopleSoft. All of them ran crypto coin miners and the data left untouched. Touched. How much money did they make? This is just one screenshot here, one of these groups that we looked at. About $30,000 a month. 
The attackers that got into Atlanta system like a couple weeks ago, they asked for $20,000, never got it. Why? Because they made the news. Attackers don't like to make the news. Installing a crypto coin miner on a system remains undetected for a long time. If it ever gets detected, I don't have to notify anybody because no data got stolen. So I'm home free. Anyway, so how do we defend against this? High CPU load. They steal your CPU. So yes, on systems you typically don't have high sustained CPU load. You may have spikes depending on your system, but not a high sustained load. Network traffic. Just like with any information, they have to exfiltrate the work they're doing. So they have to connect to these mining pools and such. That's something you can detect. There are a number of lists of these mining pools that you can access via off from one of the Internet Storm Center. And high temperature. There's one variation of this attack that's particularly kind of dangerous, and that's insiders. Like always, when insiders do things, then things get a little bit more difficult, more dangerous. Insiders installing crypto coin miners on servers that are idle, making a little bit of money on this site. The first case here I've seen was where someone actually brought hardware into a data center. A specialized server designed for crypto coin mining that was actually then placed underneath the raised floor in a data center. Caused some cooling issues, so you know maybe a little infrared camera camera should now be part of your tool set uh, to detect intrusions. And of course, you may also use that to detect high CPU loads if these are on-premise systems. Let me move on to the next threat. The next threat I like in particular, my wife, uh, she's an electrical engineer. And she always complains about how software messes up stuff. You have these wonderful hardware designs, and then a software engineer comes along and writes bad software that causes things to break. Last year, I finally was able to get back at her with Meltdown Inspector. Now, I looked a little bit closer at, you know, how far back did this actually all start? The earliest issue here I found by doing quick searches was late 60s, magnetic core memory. When you send specific read and write commands to magnetic core memory, you sometimes flipped unrelated bits. Doesn't this sound like Rowhammer? Now, what really concerned me here as a software developer was that I always trusted that hardware does its thing right. So why does hardware all of a sudden no longer work the way I expect it? Well, and the reason is quite similar to why software is having problems. Software goes bad if you're trying to do things optimized for performance, if you don't worry about security, if you want things to be fast, simple then things go wrong. Well, it turns out hardware isn't really all that different from software. It has the same complexity issues. So there's more going to come. That's the bad news part here. So as a software developer, you really have to think about how much can I trust my hardware. In particular, if I use hardware like a CPU to isolate processes from each other that may be owned by different companies, think cloud computing and such, which very heavily relies on hardware-based sort of separation of processes or, or hardware features to separate a process, if, if anything. So how do we defend against this? This is where it gets a little bit more tricky. If you can't trust hardware, who do we trust? We actually had a similar problem before. Remember networks back in the good old days? They were sort of all hardwired and secure. We learned very early on that networks can't be trusted, that our networks are assumed to be compromised. It was a big line a couple of years ago. What arose from that is the idea of encrypting data on the wire. You had TLS. SSL back in the old days you know, to, to do that and have standardized procedures, how to deal with insecure networks. Did you realize that CPUs are really just very thin, very small wires? So maybe that concept of protecting data on the wire has to move inside the system. It's not no longer just applies to, to the network. Now, how do you do it? 
keep data encrypted as much as possible. Encryption at rest. When I teach developers how to code security, this is probably one of the hardest things to do correctly, is encrypting data at rest. We pretty much sort of got it solved on the wire with TLS. But if you encrypt data at rest, where do you keep your keys? How do you encrypt your keys without them being leaked? And a lot of these attacks against CPUs, for example, just focus on exfiltrating encryption keys. So maybe we should learn how to actually operate on data without first decrypting it. And there are now a number of new encryption algorithms such that focus just on that problem. Haven't really been widely used or implemented yet because it's still you know, fairly new. And uh, I think this problem will really you know, help us probably use these algorithms more often. And with that, I'll hand it back to Elm. Thank you, Johannes. Um, the, before I do the third speaker, um, we already have about 15 great questions. And they really are good. And Jacob and Rashid are already because they're going to be the first ones, they'll get the $25 certificates. We really mean it. You send your questions to q at sans.org, um, and I think they'll add a lot of value. So please do that. And if you are trying to remember where the, I said q, at 5 at sans.org, the number 5 at sans.org. That's where you send the questions. And the website with the summary of what they were telling you is sans.org slash 5. So that's it. All right. Our third. Um, speaker today is an, an enormous expert in his own right. He's our research director for Europe, and, and he was uh, chief technology officer for Sophos. His software runs on 150 million computers. He's, he's pretty good, and he's the go-to guy in every big attack around the UK. But he's actually doing a big favor for us. Um, if you were here last year, you know that the third speaker was Mike Asante. And Mike, um, very nicely, the RSA people gave him their highest award. Um, but as those of you who know him know, he wasn't able to come because he's fighting the biggest battle of his life. So we're, we're all thinking of Mike at this point, too. But for today, James Line is going to give you the, the, he's going to channel Mike for this day. Now, Mike, for those of you who know, is the world's expert on how, how uh, power systems are attacked and protected. So for just today, James Line is going to is going to be Mike. Um, James, I asked him what, what he was most thankful for, and I thought it would be the, the security software, but he actually said it was the thing that John Stewart was talking about this morning. He, uh, he created this thing called CyberStart that discovers talented people, even who don't know they're talented, and then inspires them to have careers in cybersecurity. It, the, a whole bunch of governors ran it, and 6,500 women signed up, and it was, it's fascinating how well it works. So, uh, James Line, you're next. I appreciate the apathetic clap. Thank you, whoever that was over there. That was, <laughs> that was wonderful, you know, really good to just calm the nerves, particularly when uh, culminating in a shared interest talk with uh, you know, ICS and, and the domain that uh, Mike Asante would normally talk about. I spend most of my time focused on mainstream malicious code. For 13 years, I've unpicked interesting exploits and malware, primarily with people that are focused on making money, stealing credit cards, or increasingly, as Johannes talked about, inserting miners in more diverse, interesting ways to basically profit. But of late, I've taken a turn towards being concerned with one particular threat that I think is growing significantly. And that's threats that transcend the interest of money and fraud. The threats, or group of threats, to our critical infrastructure and that apply to the level of life and limb as we surround ourselves as a society with more and more technology that controls everything we depend on. So I was browsing around the dark web <laughs> Sorry, I can't say dark web without dropping my voice in a kind of sinister tone. Um, it's a bad habit from a few years ago when I had a journalist come to the office and um, they said, could you take me on a tour um, of the dark web? <laughs> and they kind of dropped their voice in this sinister way that made me laugh wonderfully. And ever since I've been mirroring it, I can't stop it, which of course to all of us in the room is just the internet. Um, 
so I was, I was browsing around, looking at lots of the forums where you normally buy malicious code, the kind of wares of cyber criminals. And I found a couple of examples of cyber criminals offering to work on projects focused on industrial control. And that was fascinating to me as a step outside of fraud-oriented malicious code. Now, for those of you that don't focus on this space of securing power grids and controllers, this is a, a wonderful, uh, terrifying, and unbelievable example. It is a rare treat in that it is something in the public domain that we actually get to look at targeting these systems for purposes of, of severe disruption of infrastructure. In these environments, the typical setup is you have a, a DCS, an environment and a set of systems where operators make configuration changes to the operating parameters of controllers and pieces of infrastructure that work together to generate power or do whatever they do as a part of that industrial process. To one side of that, there's an autonomous system, an SIS, a safety system. And this autonomous system sits there monitoring the process, looking for checks and balances, parameters being abused that would lead to critical failure. And critical failure here very often means life and limb impact, not loss of a credit card number. So this system sits there and does that work. Here we have a piece of malware that didn't just focus on industrial control systems, but specifically targeted the safety system. There's a growing trend in these deployments for these safety systems not to be autonomous and separated out, but to be put into the same network with the controllers and with humans using things like RDP and USB keys to issue instructions. I heard a nervous laugh there, which I think is the correct reaction. So here we have a piece of malicious code focused on disrupting the last line of defense in safety. It takes immense work to go through reverse engineering a protocol to be able to infect a system like this. So here's kind of my one threat that I want to focus on. I think it is inevitable that we'll see much more focus from attackers, from nation states, from a myriad of groups with interests beyond money on these infrastructures. And we're building more of them and putting them all around us. How prepared are we in these environments to resist memory corruption attacks and exploits? These environments were not forged in the fires of focus of cyber criminals. Unlike the operating systems that we use day to day, which have been hammered relentlessly for years, looking for bugs and exploiting them for profit, these environments have relied on obscurity. They've relied on being isolated. They have relatively embryonic practices, tons of real mode memory models that used to be a really good idea in mainstream computing. You need only look at the exploit mitigations designed to prevent memory corruption attacks to see in the world of industrial control, we have a very small list of mitigations. And in most cases, they're not even present. Right? These are very kind of configuration and vendor dependent, as opposed to mainstream computing, where we have a huge number of mitigations, even down to targeting specific new applications with purposeful mitigations, like the wonderful work that's being done in web browsers. So we have an environment that moves slowly, being targeted more, that is very ill-prepared compared to the mainstream computing world, and is being connected a hell of a lot more. But where do they go next? We have here an example of attacks on a safety controller, and I want to posit a small theory on how this may grow more dangerous. We've seen attacks against controllers, but in this industry, there's an explosion of the number of different types of sensors, the sources of truth that monitor these processes and feedback to the controllers. What scares me is when these attacks move from a DCS to a safety controller to the actual sensors 
themselves. When your source of truth is lying to you in a piece of critical infrastructure that we all depend on, you end up with very manipulative, very concerning, and very hard to detect attacks. So what should we take from this? I mean, I don't want you all to panic that you're going to walk out of here and it's going to be a die-hard movie moment and there's going to be a fire sale and everything will break. There are a lot of checks and balances. There are lots of manual processes that prevent these things going wrong. But there's a trajectory of more of this stuff with greater connectivity. Undeniably, we need to take some of the lessons learned of the mainstream computing world and rapidly focus on migrating those into our sensors, into our controllers, into these high-risk environments. The motive has been demonstrated. The potential life and limb impact is demonstrable. And these devices are about to experience a level of focus they have never seen before. Thank you very much. Good. So the, we're going to. We have about eight minutes for questions, so we're going to use every bit of it. James, while you're there, I just got one on why are they going after the SIS instead of going after the easier uh, DCS? Why? I know that's jargon, but do a quick answer. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, lots of acronyms in this space. Um, so uh, in, in the DCS environment, it's, it's frankly an easier attack surface area, and that's where traditionally, uh, with a small number of examples we see, attackers would go. I can only posit that going after the safety system was an attempt to disrupt the safeguards that would prevent a system from really going critical. That combined with probably a sister attack focused on the main environment shows that attacker likely had significant intent gotcha. to do harm, or at least was creating a backstop you know, position where they could do that in the future. It may have been kind of future preparation, yep. which is really scary. Thank you, Ed. Um, from Jacob, you, uh, when you were talking about a data inventory, the GDPR came up, and here's a question. How do you think companies will adapt to GD GDPR to protect consumer information and tell people what it is? So, so uh, <coughs> Europeans have recently passed the general data privacy regulations, uh, which have some new rules for how you protect data, uh, sensitive private information of, of consumers and citizens in Europe. Um, I am optimistic that companies will uh, embrace that and start protecting that data better, reporting better if there are breaches, storing the data, segregating it better. My worry is that this is isolated in Europe. I think this kind of protection of data Absolutely. and reporting of breaches, even breaches that have anonymous data that could be de-anonymized, which is what I talked about, um, is a big concern. So I would like to see either worldwide movement in that direction uh, by the companies themselves, or maybe through uh, some, uh, some legislation uh, in the US cool. and elsewhere. Johannes uh, Rashid asks, is it possible for the attacker to install a miner that does not connect back to a pool regularly, and how do miners, how else do miners evade detection? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> miners try to evade detection a couple different ways, uh, usually by limiting the amount of CPU they're using. They have to connect back to a mining pool somehow to sort of exfiltrate the work they're doing. Now, there are many, many different ways to do this. I mentioned these block lists that you can use. A lot of more sophisticated miners have sort of their own private proxies they're using to connect to the mining pool, so it may not be on the list. They're also quite innovative in the different protocols they're using to actually do the exfiltration. So simple stuff like doing it over TLS and such, you'll see more of that uh, to make it more difficult to detect some of these miners. Also, something like DNS and low and slow. DNS yeah. and you know, various other protocols. Uh, with that also, if you detect that a system got infected by a miner, keep in mind it probably was vulnerable to a very simple, easy, exploitable vulnerability. So the miners, the thing that you found, they're not hard to find. Most of them, you know, antivirus so picks them up pretty easily. Uh, there may be other stuff going on in the system, so don't just remove the miner and think you're good to go. Thanks. Um, Ed, you did a lot of cloud stuff. This one asks, how would you pen test an organization that has a cloud instance? How do you pen test cloud? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, increasingly, as we're moving to the cloud, 
uh, we're still called on to evaluate the security of, of these new infrastructures. So there's a couple of different things you can do. First, you can get permission from the cloud provider. And uh, some of the bigger cloud providers actually have a form that you can fill out. That you describe your pen test, where it's coming from, and their big focus is making sure you don't hurt another tenant of the cloud. And as long as you describe the work that you're going to do in a way that they're satisfied with, they'll give you permission. A second way to do that is to actually have the cloud provider do the penetration test on your behalf and give you a summary of the results. Some cloud providers will forbid a pen test, but they'll say, we'll give you the results of our last pen test because we know you need it as a customer for compliance reasons. And the third way is to actually not attack the cloud. You have these end systems that are interacting with the cloud, and you can do your pen test of the end system, seeing if you can get access to those. Cool. Oh, a, a follow-up. Oh, you, you, uh, oh I'll, I'll do this one. Uh, this is, what are the other mistakes that people make? Because you were pointing out a major mistake people made. Um, it's just too long an answer. There's a guy named Ben Hagen who is probably the nation's top guy on, on cloud security architecture. He's, I think he's at Facebook. He was at Netflix. But no one's even close to him. He's actually compiled a list of 10. Um, they're, uh, the 10 worst mistakes that cloud users make that they don't know they're making. And I think he's, gonna, he, he's getting a bunch of other users together for a meeting in a month or two on those 10. I think he's calling it the Cloud Insecurity Summit or something like that. But Ben Hagen, Cloud Insecurity, you'll, I think you'll find the list that way. Um, James from Tom. With Triton and Trisis, why it? Oh, we did that. I did that one. OK, it's more. Um, James, one more. Why have exploit mitigations lagged so heavily in the ICS space compared to mainstream computing? I think it's a force of pressure. I mean, if you look at some of the work that's been done in you know, Microsoft Windows um, around thwarting these types of attacks, they've been forced to do that through systematic abuse by cyber criminals over the years. And they've done some amazing, amazing work creating some controls that have thwarted entire bug categories. I think because of the reliance on isolation, um, on being kept kind of secret and separate from the outside world, those same things haven't been necessary. That concerns me because now we see them becoming more connected, which is an inevitable trajectory for everything in our lives. Knowing how slow the patch cycles can be, the contracts for very extended use of equipment in this area, if we don't start to try and retrofit some of those controls proactively, by the time we need them, they just won't be there. How nice. <laughs> um, Johannes, is it more difficult to detect crypto miners that are less greedy? Is that the right word, or is it greedy? Yeah, less, less greedy. So greedy. This, th this comes down to... What uh, is greedy? Well, uh, they're trying to get, get more of the CPU cycles. Okay. Uh, so what we have seen, for example, happen with some of these um, PeopleSoft miners that uh, they take so much CPU time, they actually crash some of the other software that's running on the system. So you know, once PeopleSoft stops working, you actually are going to pay attention and take a closer look at that system. And then you'll defend and then you'll detect uh, that particular uh, crypto, coiner, crypto coin miner. Uh, there is some software, some crypto coin software that tries to be less greedy. Has seen this uh, mostly in the coin jacking. When you inject JavaScript to a web page in order uh, to launch crypto coin miners on the client, initial ones uh, try to get as many CPU cycles as they could, which meant the browser would run really slow, the fan would spin up in a laptop, you would even hear that. If your browser is slow, you'll close the browser and open it again. and well, end the, the mining. So uh, more recent versions, they only take like about half of your CPU time uh, to be more difficult to detect. Cool. Um, Ed, based on your recent experiences, how do you see the structure of corporate IT security teams changing given the new trends in attacks? Will they change? Sure, I, I think they will. I think there'll be much more of a focus on data as the asset instead of individual systems. We have so many machines. You saw John Stewart's earlier presentation of these billions of IoT devices and, and, and hundreds of millions of other computing platforms. Um, the focus is going to migrate to the data, and, and the enterprise management will focus on that as well. Also, I see an increased interest in privacy. So security, again, kind of helping to improve the privacy and corporate governance focusing on privacy in addition to security. 
So it won't be a separate privacy officer, or they'll start working, they'll be working, more, together. working a lot more together. Yeah. They need each other. They really do. Johannes, do you think encryption on the wire is a viable solution to maintain confidentiality and prevent data theft? Do you believe it's a realistic approach that will be implemented by manufacturers? So having it implement manufacturers of on a CPU level would be great. And there are now a couple of initiatives, Intel, AMD, they both sort of have uh, features in recent CPUs that actually encrypt memory. Uh, real nice for me as a developer because then I can use those features and I don't have to reinvent all of this. How well they work, I think it's a little bit too early to really tell, uh, but I think that has a lot of promise and uh, hope we'll see more of that. Cool. Hey, James, how, how much effort goes into creating an attack like the one you were describing? It, it's, a, it's a lot of work. I mean, there's extensive reverse engineering. Um, you need a testing environment with a fairly realistic setup, which in of itself is a pretty substantial undertaking. Um, of course, for the types of attackers that we're, we're talking about, you know, those outside of mainstream cybercrime um, looking for political or, or military disruption, that isn't much of an obstacle. So, so very, very significant investments. What's scary in the particular case I mentioned is there are some indicators that there may have been some testing going on in a production target environment. Um, we're actually seeing some quite reckless behaviors from some of the people who are playing in, in this space. Granted, you could argue that targeting a safety system in general is reckless, but if you are going to do it, you'd expect more clinical behaviors, so okay. substantial. Good. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds, 45 seconds, to give one idea that the audience might take away from, from our panel. Before I do that, I want to pick up a theme that came up uh, a couple times today, and it was the person who said it best was um, John Stewart from Cisco, and it was really interesting about what the solution is. And John Pescatore, who ran Gartner's security service forever, um, it has exactly the same theme. If we're ever going to get this problem fixed, we're going to stop blaming the user. And we're going to ask the vendor to bake the things in we need. And we can change it and make ourselves insecure. But right now, we have insecurity by default. And that's crazy. And, uh, and only the number of people in this room acting together can even begin to, to change that. So I just wanted to get that idea that we, right now we blame ourselves, we, look, we blame our security guy, we, we fire our CIO. The person who made all that happen were the vendors who sold us the systems. They're almost impossible, the cloud in particular, they're almost impossible to secure. At some point we have to actually ask the people who's, who are making the money on this to, to sell us secure systems. But um, coming back in this order, James, you first. A last word for the... So very much extrapolation of that, that same theme. If you look at modern computers, we've done lots of work to retrofit security controls and redesign concepts of old. If you're making a procedure call stack today, you wouldn't do it the way that we did back in those days. We are about to explode the operating environment, not just with control systems, things like IoT devices. We must make sure not to reopen old wounds, apply the lessons learned to all these new devices before we allow the same mistakes to occur. Johannes, before you do it, uh, there are a whole bunch of questions we didn't get to. Uh, <coughs> the, w the RSA people have set up a second session of this online on May 15th, where we're going to do a whole bunch more questions, and they also will get the $25 gift certificates, just so you don't feel cheated. Go ahead, Johannes. I think uh, vendors made some progress. Ed mentioned some of the tools that cloud vendors sort of built into their products. I wish we could stop patching vulnerabilities that are based on default passwords, even in professional network equipment, and I could just send it back to the vendor and have them take care of it. Uh, maybe once they have a little bit more of a liability situation, that it'll help a little bit, but uh, I'm not that hopeful with in particular network equipment. In the in the last word? Uh, I encourage everybody here, we have tens of thousands of RSA participants uh, to pay it forward, uh, work with young people uh, like cyber patriot teams, high schools, local community colleges to share cybersecurity knowledge and expertise. We have to bring up the next generation and uh, advise them in how they can help solve these problems. Thank you, guys. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Yeah.